Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa, better known as the BRICS. Top representatives from these five emerging economies are meeting in Johannesburg this week for the bloc's latest summit. The group was put together several years ago as the world's most promising emerging markets and South Africa. But ever since its formation, the bloc's role and purpose has been unclear, not least in Brazil, where its importance has shifted along with economic fluctuations and changes in government. Now, under current president Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, it seems to be close to the top of the agenda once more. And that's what we're discussing this week. I'm Ewan Marshall, Deputy Editor of The Brazilian Report, and this is Explaining Brazil. If you like Explaining Brazil, you should subscribe to The Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. We're an independent organisation funded by our subscribers, and you can help us stay independent and continue to produce award-winning journalism. And if you're already a subscriber, you can go the extra mile and join our Buy Me A Coffee fan page. And in return, you'll get exclusive perks like special newsletters and behind the scenes content, as well as a shout out here in our podcast. And today I'd like to thank our Buy Me A Coffee members, Andre Novoseltsev, Tom Nolan, Marta Marchins, Pan Ludwig, Leslie Seal, Caroline Hubert, Mark Hillary, John Thomas III, Louise Renz, Erwan Menais, Orlando Black, Steve Knapp, Aaron Berger, James Coney, Kars Vriesvik, Alistair Townsend, Peter Abramson, Gemma wolf Michael Fryer, Mila Renacido, David Dixon, Jose Ozi Stankovic, Emerging Market Muser, Jarden Eftach, Tonika Thompson, Anderson Da Silva, Kat Kramer, Peter Suffren, Anna Lund and someone who chose to remain anonymous. And our Buy Me A Coffee members come from all over the world, so please, if we're butchering the pronunciation of your name, do send us an email. And if you too believe in the importance of independent journalism, and if you want to hear your name on our podcast, go to buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report and subscribe to one of the membership levels. Click on buymeacoffee.com slash Brazilian Report to learn more. With Vladimir Putin staying home for fear of arrest and the shadow of the Ukraine war hanging over the summit, this year's BRICS meeting in South Africa has earned some major attention worldwide, not least because the bloc may about to be getting bigger. And covering the BRICS summit for the Brazilian report is Sede Silva, our correspondent in Brasilia, and he's our guest today. So Sede, take us back to the start, if you will. How did the BRICS come about and what was the original idea behind the group? Okay, so the BRICS is a very specific occurrence, very rare occurrence in international relations in that it is a geopolitical grouping that began as an idea by a, a banking analyst. So it, it, it actually, the idea began in a report for a uh, for international bankers, for international investors. And years later, uh, the group actually, uh, the, the, the leaders of these countries actually turned the idea into reality, but it was not supposed to be a geopolitical grouping in the first place. So the BRICS began in a 2001 report by a Goldman Sachs analyst named Jing O'Neill. And in this report, he was this was late 2001, uh, the war on terror was just beginning. This was a very different scenario from today. And at the time, uh, Jim O'Neill said that the BRICS share of world GDP was set to rise. So the BRICS, of course, are Brazil, Russia, India, and China, hence the pun with the word in English, uh, BRIC or economic BRICS. And on a purchasing power parity basis, the aggregate size of the BRICS at that time was about 23% of the world GDP at the end of 2000, which was somewhat higher than that of both Euroland and Japan. And this is, is interesting, Iwan, because at the time, people were still referring to the European economic zone as Euroland, which is a term that also went out of fashion, right? And this report, um, to once again uh, talk about geopolitics, um, the idea of the Goldman Sachs analyst was not for the BRICS 
to form a geopolitical bloc. And in fact, the, the original report in 2001 has a, has a different recommendation. It says that the G7, at the time it was the G7, not yet the G8 with uh, Russia, they said that uh, the G7 should incorporate China, probably Brazil and Russia, and possibly India. So this was um, a, a completely different idea. So you have uh, a Western bank, the Goldman Sachs Bank, with his economists uh, saying about this big emergency, these big emerging economies, they are set to grow a lot in the future, and the G7 should incorporate uh, at least some of them, preferably at least China, in order to bring them together to this uh, global economic policy coordination uh, that people uh, were still talking about at the time. Of course, the rivalry between the United States and China, for example, was was not a present at the time. And the main uh, opponent of the United States government at the time uh, was thought to be Al-Qaeda and the war on terror was going on. So this was a, a very different world uh, from, from what we have today. And there was a prediction at the start of the BRICS that the four original members would become part of the top five global economies, right? Yeah, so after this report, uh, in 2001, there, there were so too many different scenarios. There was not a very bold prediction about where these uh, BRICS would uh, end up. But 10 years later, in 2011, Goldman Sachs issued another report and it said that it expects the BRICS to account for close to 40% of global GDP by 2050 and to have become four of the world's top five economies. So by 2050, according to this uh, 2011 prediction, uh, the BRICS and the United States would be uh, the five uh, top world economies. Well, we're now in 2023. So how's that 2050 prediction looking? I mean, China has definitely come on leaps and bounds, but the rest, less so. Does the alliance still make sense in this regard? Yeah, so concerning only the original BRIC, uh, this prediction is not far off if we take the the same uh, criteria, so IMF data by uh, PPP data. So all four of the original BRIC are in the top 10 economies today by purchasing power parity. You have China, number one, India, number three, Russia at number six, and Brazil at number eight. So they are there, at least in the top 10, uh, if only China and India are in the top five. Uh, you were correct that there is a very huge imbalance between China and all the others. Uh, China's current GDP by purchasing power parity is larger than all the four other BRICS, uh, including South Africa now, combined. So, so China is really uh, that much bigger than all the other members. You've got China with a purchasing power parity GDP of approximately $33 trillion against $23 trillion of all the other members combined. So that's $10 trillion more than India, Russia, Brazil, and South Africa all combined. And so there are some people uh, questioning uh, this grouping of, of uh, countries um, because China's uh, size and China's power is so much larger than all than uh, of the other members. So, Sede, when the four-member BRICS was formalized in 2009, Brazil was still in that moment of kind of giddy optimism. Uh, the Brazilian real was strong, commodities were flying high, the World Cup and the Olympics were both on the horizon, and the BRICS seemed to kind of underline that whole process, that Brazil was going to be the next big thing on the global stage. Now, 14 years on, what does the BRICS mean to Brazil? Well, so President Lula gave a speech on uh, Johannesburg, uh, where the BRICS summit is in South Africa uh, this Tuesday. And what he wants is he wants the BRICS to be another platform for Brazil's and Lula's longstanding policy of multilateralism and of getting the global South together. So the BRICS is another platform uh, where Brazil will push for multilateral rules, for a multilateral way of working, and for the countries to come on the global stage, everyone together, so that the rules on trade, human rights, uh, on environment, uh, on all the on all the topics uh, should be discussed 
uh, in large groupings and should be and should be valid for everyone. And Sidi, some of the big hubbub ahead of this week's summit is on the potential expansion of the group. So who wants into the BRICS and why? And how does that process work? So last week I attended a briefing at the at Brazil's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And to their calculations, 22 countries have already expressed formal interest in joining the BRICS. Among them, you've got Argentina, Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, and other countries uh, in the global south. You, your question about how does that process work, uh, the thing is they don't know yet. Uh, they're, they're discussing this week a set of rules or, or a set of criteria for how to join BRICS because uh, as of now, those rules are non-existent. Since the BRICS uh, became an actual group, uh, there was only one expansion, which was South Africa joining in at the invitation of China, and uh, the other members agreed at the time, but currently there is no rules uh, for that uh, to, to happen. And this is, this is one of the things in Brazil's agenda. So the leaders will be uh, discussing in Johannesburg a future criteria and a future set of rules for for more countries to join in in the future. Yes, so we're recording on Tuesday and listeners will be able to hear this episode of Wednesday morning. So it's all speculation at this point. But let's say that Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates and Argentina join the BRICS. What impact might that have on Brazil? Okay, so um, Brazil's position on this and, and what they said, what the diplomats said at the briefing to reporters is that Brazil wants to use BRICS expansion um, to favor or to leverage Brazil's other interests uh, in its foreign policy. Among them, for example, um, Brazil's ambition uh, to reform the United Nations Security Council and Brazil's presidency of the G20, which is coming up late this year and will last uh, most of 2024. Um, there are several risks uh, in this taking place uh, because, for example, uh, Lula has said specifically that he is in favor of Argentina joining in. But as Brazilian report readers know, um, Argentina is currently in its own presidential elections process. And there is the possibility that a far right candidate that uh, has vocally opposed Mercosur which is Brazil's trade alliance with Argentina, Paraguay, and Uruguay, uh, he could win. And so Argentina is joining in with Javier Milei as a possible president uh, could severely diminish um, Brazil's um, hopes of using the BRICS as a leverage, as a tool for its other uh, foreign policy ambitions. And the thing that I have um, I have taken from a recent uh speech or class by uh, former Vice President Al Gore. Uh, Al Gore is now talking about uh, these Arabic countries hosting and sponsoring the climate conferences. And as you know, uh, late this year, the United Arab Emirates are going to host the COP, the United Nations Climate Conference. And what can happen is if there are a lot of Arabic oil producing countries in BRICS, um, this will make it hard for Brazil to speak with a strong voice on climate change uh, or on energy transition, since there are a lot of Arabic countries together. They're still oil producing. They do not have any plans to stop. And they and, and it will be hard for Brazil to speak with a clear, clear voice uh, on climate issues with all these OPEC countries getting involved. And if the group does open its doors to more members, I mean, we talked about Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates there, which are reasonably large economies in GDP terms. With them on side, do you think the BRICS could maybe rival, you know, groups like the G7 or the G20? You know, where does Brazil stand on that idea? Well, it, it is certainly is Lula's ambition and, and very possibly China and Russia's ambition to, uh, to make the BRICS actually a counterbalance uh, to the G7 at least. And, and this is because uh, one of their very public demands has been the reform of the international financial architecture. Uh, Lula has recently attended a summit uh, in Paris uh, with President Emmanuel Macron, and he has said very specifically about this. And uh, there are very specific speeches by uh, Lula and, and the other BRICS countries 
uh, in making more trade and increasing trade among the global south, first thing. And second thing, uh, doing this uh, with uh, without the dollar or reducing the need for dollars. And yeah, I was going to come on to that. Uh, currency has been another one of the talking points this year regarding the BRICS, uh, with Lola saying this Tuesday in South Africa that he'd back a, quote, reference unit of account for trade between the nations. So what's the rationale there? Yeah, so so the rationale there is really a reform of the finan- of the international financial architecture. They really want to make trade um, less dependent on the U.S. dollar. And early this year, uh, Brazil has already, the Brazil Central Bank actually signed an agreement uh, on this with the Chinese Central Bank. Uh, and there is already one... Um, Chinese bank headquartered in Brazil that has already been uh, officially listed by the Chinese government as uh, being allowed to uh, make uh, trade uh, transactions uh, between reais and renminbi without the need for the US dollar. China has already a similar arrangements in other countries, including the UK, and China has, uh, certainly has an interest to do this in other countries as well. Uh, what Lula said this Tuesday uh, in South Africa is that uh, the BRICS are thinking of a reference unit of account, which is uh, a sort of virtual currency. It, it's not an actual physical currency issued by a bank, but it is uh, some sort of tool uh, so that when there is trade among the global south, so among the BRICS or among their associates, uh, you would do this directly uh, in their own national currencies and without needing to trade uh, dollars, without using dollars as, as an intermedi- uh, intermediary currency. And this is certainly uh, very much in the interests of uh, both China and Russia, uh, especially given uh, sanctions are currently uh, enforced against Russia, because this means that they need, they will be less dependent on dollars for their trade, and they will be able to trade oil, gas, Etc. And and buy uh, Brazilian goods or or, or sell um, uh, fertilizers to Brazil, etc. Uh, without uh, needing to trade dollars and with and without um, the need to to use uh, dollars that might be uh, sanctioned or frozen uh, somewhere else. And Sidi, just to round things off here, uh, I find it interesting that there are talks of the BRICS rivaling the US and the G7, potentially doing away with the dollar as a trade currency, as you mentioned. And all this within the context of the Ukraine war, which has opposed the US and Europe against Russia and China. Is this one big coincidence, say they, or is this all an important backdrop to what we're seeing here? That's definitely not a coincidence, Ewan. Um, just last week, uh, we had an important remark by an advisor that works for uh, Celso Morin. Celso Morin is Lula's chief foreign policy advisor, and he used to be foreign minister, but is now a, a foreign policy advisor. He has been to Moscow and to Ukraine this year, so um, he has a very important role uh, in foreign affairs, I would say even more than foreign minister Mauro Vieira. So Celso Morin has in his team an special advisor named Adriana Abdenur, and last week she attended a hearing in Brazil's house with U.S. lawmakers, including Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and other Democratic lawmakers the, from the U.S. that came here to Brazil. And on this meeting, Adriana Abdenur, who works for Lula's foreign policy team, she was she was telling to the U.S. lawmakers, literally, uh, when you strike at China, you hit Brazil. And by you, she meant the United States. So, she, so, so you have a Brazilian official saying that when the United States hit a strike at China, they also hit Brazil. And they also hit other developing countries. So Brazil has really embraced, I would say, even more than in Lula's first spell as president, um, a policy of really siding with China specifically um, in this reformist ambition of um, getting the international system with new roles that go um, differently from the Bretton Woods uh, IMF UN institutions formed uh, in the late 40s and really going for uh, a reform of the international system. And this uh, it speaks not only to Brazil's specific ambitions of, of having a larger role, but Brazil really joining in Team China 
even with this uh, specific remarks. And this also is in line with something else that we've addressed in the Brazilian report, which is after former President Dilma Rousseff uh, uh, became the head of the New Development Bank, which is the BRICS Bank headquartered in Shanghai, she hired as her advisor uh, Elias Jabour, who is a professor, uh, an economics professor, and he is a really, really striking China apologist. So what we're really saying is, um, what really seeing is uh, Brazil really aligning itself with China and also uh, with Russia in this uh, conflict, not only about Ukraine, but uh, about the future of the international system. Thanks very much, Sidi. I'm looking forward to reading your bricks right up later this week. Thank you very much, Ewan. Uh, see you next time. If you like Explaining Brazil, please give us a five-star rating wherever you get your podcasts. It only takes a second and it will help us reach a wider audience. Or better yet, subscribe to The Brazilian Report, the journalistic engine behind this podcast. We have a subscription-based business model and your memberships fuel our journalism and keep us going and growing. Thanks to our subscribers, we've been able to cover Brazil and Latin America extensively and our work has won and been shortlisted for several international journalism awards. More recently, our newsletters won the best newsletter prize in the Americas from the World Association of Newspapers and News Publishers for a small or local newsroom. And in order to keep doing that work, we need your support. So go to brazilian.report slash subscribe. I'm Ewan Marshall. Thanks for listening and Explaining Brazil will be back next week.